Turning to today, just this morning, a global consortium of investigative journalists has lifted the lid on the offshore holdings amassed by an array of leading figures in China. So there couldn't be a better time to discuss the issue of press freedom in the context of data leaks and official inquiries around the world. And few people can better address the intersection of law and journalism than our guest today, Mark Warby, QC. Mark is joint head of 5RB, the specialist media and entertainment law chambers in London. Mark has acted for and against some of the UK's major newspaper groups in cases involving the likes of Naomi Campbell, Prince Charles and Max Mosley, cases that have redefined what the media can and cannot report on celebrities' private lives. If uh, Mark doesn't mind me saying, he's also a keen surfer and uh, could well have been a journalist himself. At the tender age of 13, he uh, won uh, the Observer's Young Journalist of the Year Award and asked for a surfboard as his prize. They gave him a typewriter instead. <laughs> Journalism's loss was the legal profession's gain. Mark will now present his thoughts, and we'll leave time for audience questions before wrapping up at 2, 40, uh, two o'clock. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Thank you very much, Jitendra. Having dug up some uh, information that I thought had been well buried, um, it, it's, it's remarkable what the internet can, can give you. It's an honour and a pleasure to be asked to speak to you today on this topic. Um, first of all, uh, a warning. Some of what I've got to say may upset and ruffle a few feathers. I've been warned about that, and I'm going to warn you. So please don't throw anything while I'm speaking. Uh, we can have a good debate afterwards if you think that I've got it all wrong um, from the English perspective, because I am not only a foreigner, but a first-time visitor to Hong Kong. And in that capacity, I think it's only right that I should present my credentials in due course, which I shall do. Um, but first, some apologies for absence. Um, this lady left a voicemail message uh, yesterday afternoon, so I'm told. Uh, she said she had some strong views on this topic, which she would love to have shared with you, uh, but she's preoccupied at present. Здравствуйте, как дела? You can guess where that comes from. That's from uh, the other side. Uh, he, of course, Mr Snowden, would have loved to be here too, but he finds his travel options rather limited these days. Those two being unavoidably absent, uh, I've got the chance to offer you my perspectives on these important topics. Uh, my credentials. Uh, first of all, I am a, a foreign correspondent. I'm here as your foreign correspondent talking to you uh, about what happens in the UK. My only claim to a connection with Hong Kong prior to this is via this story. Um, appalling waxworks was what Prince Charles recorded in his travel journals when he came here to attend Handover, and it was a reference less than flattering to the Chinese officials who were there. Uh, I had the task of defending uh, the Mail on Sunday over that story, uh, trying to persuade judges uh, that it was in the public interest that we should learn the views of the heir to the throne about the leading figures in one of the world's uh, biggest economies and most powerful countries. They, for some reason, disagreed, but we've soldiered on. Uh, that may be a, a tenuous claim uh, to a connection with this uh, city and this region. My other credentials can be stated fairly shortly. Uh, I've written or edited this book. I've read this report by Lord Justice Leveson, and I've got one of these, and I'm not afraid to use it, which distinguishes me, of course, from both of the people that I've mentioned as being unavoidably absent or perhaps Rebecca Wade is not af afraid to use it, but unable. Uh, and that brings me to my first uh, serious observation. Uh, we live in interesting and rather alarming times, uh, an era in which, for the first time in my lifetime, journalists are being arrested, and uh, many of them prosecuted, in substantial numbers in Western countries. Well, at least one Western country, uh, my own. Uh, the event that's had the greatest publicity, perhaps, uh, back home over recent months is the arrest of uh, a gentleman called David Miranda, the partner of a Guardian journalist, Glenn Greenwald, under terrorist powers, uh, apparently on suspicion that he was assisting in the trafficking of tra state secrets um, for his journalist partner. Uh, the government spoke of information that would help terrorism. And the Guardian called this a profound escalation of the attack on journalism. And it's certainly a very worrying thing to have happened. 
But I wonder really whether that is apt language for that single arrest of someone who's not a journalist, uh, because one of the curious things about the Snowden affair is that journalism has actually remained largely unaffected uh, by interference, largely. On the other hand, as Private Eye has pointed out, if one's looking for something that can truly be called an attack on journalism, uh, perhaps these three uh, parallel inquiries by the Metropolitan Police uh, would qualify. In those inquiries, the total number of journalists arrested so far is alleged by Private Eye, admittedly, to have reached that number. Uh, I don't know whether that's right. It's very difficult to get information about this, but as far as I can make out, it's certainly more than 80. And these inquiries uh, and the current Old, ba Old Bailey prosecution have swallowed up vast amounts of public money. These are the best figures I can uh, get. They're uh, nearly a year old, uh, but those are the figures for, for the, uh, pol the police inquiries, uh, not the trial. Uh, then we've got the Leveson inquiry. That swallowed up further vast resources. Nine months of oral hearings, hundreds of witnesses, over £5 million pounds, uh, and $68.5 million dollars, uh, Hong Kong uh, of cost on that. Vast public resources devoted to these inquiries and investigations. Uh, and when governments devote that sort of money and that sort of effort to that sort of exercise, two questions uh, seem to me to arise. Uh, they're familiar questions to any human rights lawyer necessity and proportionality. Uh, proportionality is key. Uh, could the same objective have been achieved in a less intrusive way? Well, let's confine ourselves to the moment for, to the criminal process. Many would say uh, back home that what is going on is necessary to lance a boil. We've had a terrible sequence of events, unprecedented misbehavior by journalists. That's the way lots of people do talk. Um, uh, after the phone hacking uh, inquiry and the scandals that are surrounding it. But that line of argument assumes the existence of the misconduct alleged, uh, and I'm going to avoid that. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't take the view that it's always wrong in every circumstance to invoke the criminal law against a journalist just because they're a journalist. Uh, I, I, it must be the case that immunity is not total. Without taking a position, though, on the disputed issues in these cases, it is possible uh, to be extremely alarmed by what's going on. Uh, I found it profoundly troubling to witness, I'm sorry, I'm going back, um, to, to witness what's gone on in terms of these arrests. The reason I think that many of us who are troubled are so troubled is that we see journalism as having a special intrinsic value that doesn't depend on exactly what is being done in the name of journalism. Uh, we believe that it isn't and shouldn't generally be the business of the state to suppress or threaten journalistic endeavor. Uh, and we believe that in a free society, uh, the use of the criminal law against journalists uh, should be the absolutely last resort, only when the matter is really serious uh, and there is absolutely no realistic alternative should it be contemplated. But there is the rub. Uh, there's the problem, I think. Was there, in the context that we have and have had in the UK, of what is suspected to be large-scale phone hacking uh, by journalists of not only celebrities but others, was there a realistic alternative? Uh, I put the question at a general level. And I'll admit, uh, and here's one of the things that may uh, upset, uh, that I've surprised myself by the conclusion that I have reached. Uh, that is, that the deployment of the criminal law in these cases was an understandable response to what appeared to be a pressing problem. And what has happened, I think, is this, that the criminal law has been deployed to fill in a vacuum left by the absence of a regulatory system. In other words, if you have journalists apparently committing serious wrongs against members of the public, and there is no regulator that is capable of doing something about it, then it's understandable that the state steps in and exploits the criminal law. And the situation we were in and remain in at the moment is that there was and is no effective regulatory 
oversight of journalists. We do have this uh, organisation, the Information Commissioner's Office, which strangely enough is a statutory regulator that covers the press. Everything that is put out by the press these days, and uh, all media, is data uh, the subject of this regulatory scheme. But this guy doesn't want to regulate the press, quite rightly, I dare say, uh, and he's probably, uh, his setup is unsuited to the task. We have the Press Complaints Commission, but that's not a regulator. It's widely misunderstood and it's often criticised for failing in its regulatory task. But the clue is in the name. It's a complaints commission. It deals pretty well and has done over the years with complaints about press behaviour, but it is not a regulator and never was. Uh, what it demonstrated by its attempts uh, to deal with the phone hacking scandal at news group no newspapers uh, was that it, in it was incapable of becoming a regulator. Uh, notoriously, it pronounced that it could see and had seen no evidence of anything of that kind going on. But we now know that there was some of it. Uh, quite how much, we don't know yet, but there was. So I say the fact that the press was in effect unregulated during this period uh, left the authorities with relatively few options. Uh, once the uh, scandal or the Millie Dowler story came out in The Guardian uh, saying that there had been phone hacking uh, of her phone, uh, uh, then politically something had to be done. I'm sorry, I keep putting on to the next slide. Uh, that leads, I think, to an important conclusion, which is... Uh, one that's gone largely unrecognised, that effective press regulation provides a buffer between the practice of journalism and the criminal law. If properly carried out, it can protect those who exercise their freedom of expression through journalism from the most extreme in interferences which should very rarely uh, be uh, suffered, namely criminal prosecution and potential imprisonment. But don't misunderstand me when I talk about regulation. What's most important is that regulation, if it has to be imposed in the particular context, should be independent of uh, government. So a second conclusion that I'd offer you is that independent uh, self-regulation of the press offers this further advantage. It provides a buffer between journalism and the state generally uh, and can thus, thus uh, enhance press freedom, paradoxically perhaps. Now, those observations all flow from the UK context and the experiences that I've uh, just covered in brief. They may or may not be points that uh, hold good in other contexts outside the United Kingdom. I've already confessed that I'm not uh, familiar with the context here. I know enough from reading the papers over the last few days that it's a very different one from the one that we have back home. So, please tell me during the question and answer session uh, whether I've got it completely wrong for you. Whether in the UK we will have effective press regulation uh, such as could serve as a buffer against uh, state interference is another question and a complicated one and it's got a long history and this is the two minute version if that. Because our Prime Minister thought that uh, legislation as recommended by Lord Justice Leveson was a step too far, we ended up with this, a royal charter, uh, decided upon by a group of politicians, recommended to the Queen and created by her. It's thought by some commentators to be too cumbersome and legalistic. Um, this was a very upsetting headline for those of us who practice in this area. Um, we thought we could do it. Uh, a key feature of it, though, is that it does not create or compel anyone to create or to join a regulatory system, all it does is set up the regulatory scheme for someone else to create a, a regulator uh, to be approved by it. And the press have put up two fingers to it. Uh, they're the only ones who really uh, would be likely to create a regulator to regulate them. They've decided not to do one in the form that the, the uh, government would like. Um, they are, um, sorry, they, they've created uh, their own organisation called IPSO, the Independent Press Standards Organisation, which stands a good chance, in my view, of being a pretty effective regulator, although it's been heavily criticised by some as being nothing more than PCC Mark II. 
So I think there will emerge in the UK from the current long-running impasse a regulator sponsored and paid for by the press, like the Press Complaints Commission, uh, which, but which has wider ranging powers and can be seen as a more effective uh, press regulator than its predecessor, which, as I say, wasn't really a regulator at all. And that, I hope and believe, optimistically, will actually provide greater protection for freedom of expression uh, than the absence of any regulator. Now, let's uh, get back to Edward Snowden and The Guardian. On the face of it, that story could hardly be more different from phone hacking. Uh, we have a remarkable multinational problem story here. Uh, the leader of the free world uh, has seemed bent on, on categorizing Snowden uh, as a traitor. Uh, Mr. Snowden flees uh, abroad, uh, making a brief stop over here uh, for that reason, but ending up in the arms of Mr. Putin, hardly the world's uh, most renowned proponent or advocate of freedom of expression, uh, the man who uh, runs the regime which imprisoned the Pussy Riot Group uh, until recently uh, and held Greenpeace prot protesters for many weeks. Uh, a very curious set of facts. But oddly, the facts of that story do have three features in common with the phone hacking situation. First, we're concerned with spying on people through technical means. Secondly, we have uh, what seems to be a failure of regulation or oversight by the people responsible for uh, governance of spying activity. And thirdly, uh, it all comes to light in newspaper revelations. The key differences, I think, for present purposes are that it's not journalists, in this instance, spying on people in pursuit of stories for publication about their private lives. It's the state spying on their own people in the interest, it is said, of protecting national security. Now, one would think that provided a great deal more justification for the spending of public money on looking into what exactly happened, whether it was justified, whether it was proportionate. Uh, but the statistics on this story are those. One arrest, David Miranda, no public inquiries so far, and no money spent so far as one can detect on investigating the merits or, or demerits of what Mr. Snowden has revealed. What conclusions should we draw? Well, it's relatively early days for this story, uh, but uh, my feelings at the moment are uh, these. It is worrying that the government response in the United Kingdom, and uh, to a large extent in the United States, uh, has been so weak. Uh, almost non-existent. Uh, there is talk of some sort of inquiry being launched, but nothing's happened yet. And I don't know about you, but I find uh, the notion of being spied on by my own government a lot more troubling than the risk of having my voicemails intercepted and uh, some uh, journalists listening to me telling my wife I'll be home on the 4.52. Uh, a lot more troubling because the government is supposed to be looking after my interests, supposed to be my representative. So why so many resources devoted to the investigation of phone hacking and so little so far to these allegations? Uh, secondly, uh, on the other hand, there is some comfort to be gained from the limits to government action, at least in the UK, against those making the revelations. Yes, Snowden is on the run and can't be got at, so the fact that nothing's been done against him is probably insignificant. Uh, he's not a UK citizen, uh, it's for the US to do what it can, if it wants to. And yes, there's been the arrest of David Miranda, the journalist's partner, but nobody is even talking about or whispering about prosecuting The Guardian or anyone else in the United Kingdom for revealing what Mr Snowden has said. The stories are out, even though governments would rather they were not uh, and have made it clear. And that, I think, is quite a healthy sign of a democracy and the independent judiciary that I think are essential guarantors of press freedom, at least in our context. I think our government, at least, daren't take action in relation to these publications for those reasons. Democracy helps 
because it governs the sort of legislation that you get. Fewer bad laws emerge in democracies. They're not perfect and they are variable, uh, but fewer bad laws emerge from them than perhaps from other regimes. Uh, they also involve perhaps more effective uh, holding to account of decision makers, such as a prime minister who would have to authorize uh, action against newspapers for publishing things that are said not to be in the national interest. And independence is crucial in two ways, I think. First of all, if there's to be a regulatory system for journalism, as there will be, I'm sure, in our context, the independence of that system from government, from the state, is absolutely vital for obvious reasons. But secondly, independence in the judiciary is a fundamental guarantee that if things go past a regulatory system, or there isn't one, uh, and go to court at the instigation of the state, there will be a fair trial. Uh, and those two things uh, provide essential checks to protect freedom of expression, at least in the UK context. Constant vigilance is, of course, necessary to protect freedom of expression from unnecessary uh, or even malign interference. But I would suggest overall, it's not in such bad health today, freedom of expression, as some might suggest. Uh, and I hope uh, that we'll have a, a, a vigorous debate about whether my suggestions about my own country's experience have any application at all to yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we'll open the discussion up to the floor. Um, I'll just um, start, if I may, with a, a question about the broader international context in as far as you can address it. London has, has sometimes been described as, as the libel capital of the world. Um, there is a concern that with further uh, legal and, and, and regulatory changes down the road, perhaps, um, that, that, that reputation will only be reinforced as the rich and the powerful resort to the London courts to defend their reputations, to exercise, as they see it, their right to privacy. Do you see uh, that trend emerging? Is, is that a concern that we, we in the media, should, uh, uh, should worry about? Well, I understand. Uh, I completely understand why. I understand why that uh, reputation has got about. Um, it's largely based, I think, on, on history, not ancient history, but uh, history probably from the 80s, when um, the powerful were able to and did get pretty large awards of damages from juries. Uh, we've just had a new defamation act that came into force on the 1st of January, and it has rebalanced things in ways which I think reinforce trends which were already there, uh, which reduce the um, attractions of London as a, a venue for libel actions. But it's, there's no doubt that it still is a lot easier uh, to bring uh, and succeed in a libel action in London or in England than it is in a lot of other places. And the big contrast, of course, is between England and the United States, where it's practically impossible to bring an action to protect your reputation. You have to prove, if, you, if you're anyone in the public eye, that the, the, the publication was malicious. So it will always be the case, I think, um, for, for the foreseeable future, that um, American-based uh, journalists and lawyers will view English libel law as failing the test of proper protection of freedom of expression. Um, but there's not much we can do about that. that. That's true of most countries around the world, I think. Thank you. Um, if any questions from the floor, if you could um, just wait for the microphone, please, and uh, introduce yourselves. I see one over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Chen. I work for Mandic White Asia. It's an FT trade publication. Um, I have a slight different interpretation of the UK government's reaction, and I wonder what do you think. I don't really agree that the British government showed they are different from the US by not persecuting the Guardian or the journalist. I think they, they, what they did was a rather calculated 
well, they took rather calculative action. They arrested a Brazilian, a foreigner. People don't care too much in Britain. So not a strong enough action to enrage the British public or damage their image as a government that champions freedom of press. However, it is strong enough a warning on journalists for, to journalists personally. Look, there can be serious consequences for yourself. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, the, the, uh, the line that's been taken by the Guardian, which may be right, we don't know, is that that was a step designed to intimidate. Um, that's one of the things that I think we should have an inquiry to investigate. It's one of the things that's been called for, uh, an investigation to why that happened. And there may yet be legal action to challenge the arrest. But it, I think it's just impossible to, to, to tell at the moment whether that was so. The, the, the UK government is saying that um, the action was taken independently by the police and not directed by the Home Office. Now, uh, I'm an agnostic on that. I really am. There's a follow-up. A yeah, quick follow-up and then... Yeah. Very quick follow-up. Do you think, had the arrested person be a British mem member of the British public, it would have been different? There would be a stronger, much stronger appeal calling um, from everywhere to launch an inquiry. No, I don't. Uh, I don't. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I think that the, the British public, if, if that's the question, the British public don't, very, don't care very much about this issue at the moment. Quite wrongly, but they really don't. They wouldn't be very exercised by the arrest of another journalist, number 121. Over there, please. So Robin Fox, I'm an associate. Um, you glossed over a little bit the uh, contents of the framework for the regulatory system. Can I ask you what uh, actions uh, took place um, which were complained about by members of Hacked Off which were not uh, illegal at the time? Were there any at all? Sorry. Were there, were there any issues um, which formed the basis of the complaint about the press that were not actually legal? Phone hacking certainly is, but what else? Uh, I, I, can't, I can't answer that. They may have all been illegal, that's true. So isn't it a question of enforcing the existing regulatory framework rather than putting a political body in charge of press regulation? No, I don't think it is because I don't think there is an existing regulatory framework. I mean, if, 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 what my point is that um, if you've got an effective regulator, let's say a professional regulator in, in the medical profession or, or the legal profession, um, that, that takes steps to investigate and, and over, oversee the way that the business is conducted and ensure that it's done properly and takes steps to, to, to um, sanction people when it's not, then the criminal law doesn't need to step in because it's not proportionate. And, and you can take different views about how serious this kind of behaviour really is. Um, I, I do believe that in a properly regulated system, which we may have, uh, it would have been sufficient uh, possibly to stop some of this behaviour in the first place, to have a regulator, and if it happened, to take regulatory action which might have included fines. Tara? Thanks for that thought-provoking speech. I'm Tara Joseph with Reuters. When you were talking about an independent regulator, I was trying to envision who these people would be what types of people they would be. If you have a medical regulator, it's probably people with some knowledge of medicine and there is a, a set of certification or a sense of what is done in medicine. In the legal regulation, you have laws, but we don't really have a set of laws. We might have a self sense of principles in journalism. So who would these guys be? Well, um, the there are two models which are broadly similar. One is the, um, the Royal Charter model, and the other is the Ipso model. Um, the differences between them are, are marginal because they, they both involve journalists in the system, people with experience. Uh-oh. <laughs> I can imagine journalists regulating journalists. Well, but they are in the minority. Um, there are different levels of this. One, one element of it is setting the code, the code of conduct. Now, 
there's a lot, a lot of fuss about this, but in, in, in the end, if you think about it, the elements of any code of journalism are well known. And that if you look at codes around the world, um, they're all pretty similar. Uh, try not to get it wrong. If you do, put it right, um, or apologize if it's serious enough. Um, don't publish things about people's private lives that don't have, have, a, have, a, have a public interest justification. That's a list of things. It's not difficult. Um, so getting journalists involved in devising the, 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 the code, I think, is quite important. But I don't think it's a very significant uh, causal thing, because the code will end up pretty much the same, whoever does it. The, everyone agrees, I think, that journalists should be involved or could be involved in, in an independent regulator. The question is how, whether they dominate it. And so the preferred model, I think, is the government's preferred model, is you have more people who are not journalists than journalists. Um, and that is a model which, in fact, is, is more independent than the Bar Standards Board, which regulates me. They have lay people and they have lawyers, and um, it doesn't seem to me to be an intrinsically impossible model. Anna. Um, Anna Fenton, um, hack, for want of a better word. Um, many of my former colleagues are languishing at home. These are Sun and News International employees at the moment, on full pay granted, but unable even to phone their colleagues because they think all their phones are tapped. Now, they're all charged under this thing, under this Leveson um, action. Two questions, really, out of this. Since most of the bribees have already pleaded guilty, these guys would seem to be on a hiding to nothing before they start. Um, and where will this all end? Because once they're found guilty, I'm sure there will be appeals and it will go on and on and on. And as you say, there are scores of these folks. But the other thing is, whatever way you cut it, none of this was done in a vacuum and the big bosses all signed off on all these dreadful deeds. So why is it that it's not News International in the dock? Why is it all the hacks? Well, uh, uh, where will it all end? Um, I fear you're right that, uh, not that they'll all be convicted just because some have been have pleaded guilty, but it will continue, it'll take a long time, and, and there may be appeals. Um, that's one of the reasons that I'm advocating a regulatory system instead of the use of the criminal law. I, I believe, perhaps naively, that it could be swifter and cheaper and less oppressive um, which is how I see the, the current setup. As far as the question of the, the, the more senior people and their fate is concerned, there are people um, who believe that News International has shot itself in the foot collectively um, by being so open with uh, information about what went on. Because once, in, in legal theory anyway, once you get people convicted who are at senior decision-making levels, you've got the company in the frame uh, for a further prosecution. Whether you go beyond that to um, people uh, on the board would, been, would depend on whether they were personally involved. But I don't rule out, if, if some of the editorial people are, are, are convicted, a further prosecution involving the company. Yeah. Is there a prospect, do you think, uh, through regulatory means or otherwise, of creating some sort of perhaps delicate balance between the, the, the attitude towards reporting on uh, politicians and celebrities and the uh, prurient interest taken by the public in Britain, it would seem, in um, the personal lives of those people in comparison with, for example, France? Do you think? Um, some form of education of the British readership could take place through a regulatory process? Well, that's a very interesting question, isn't it? I, I was told by the judge who does most of these cases the other day that um, almost all the cases that come to court are not media cases now. In other words, the, there was a great boom in cases about people's private lives being, inter being, being interfered with by the media. That's over. And um, so that may indicate that 
the press have already been educated by the judgments of the court. And, and I think there's quite a lot in that. It's not where it was in France, um, where private lives were sacrosanct until Monsieur Hollande um, got on his scooter. I think things are equalizing uh, across the channel. Uh, they're becoming more prurient while we become less open about it, I think. Probably continuing to be prurient without, without putting it on the front page. I just want to follow up on that last point. Is the example of France, you know, chills a lot of journalists uh, who read in the UK with the, with, the, with the extent to which the pendulum there protects the right to privacy. Is there any country, do you think, that does have a regulatory system that does strike the right balance for, and for which Britain could take, uh, take heed from? No. <laughs> you look around, and, and um, this is one of the reasons I did my cultural rel relativism point, because it does all depend. It depends very much on cultural attitudes, I think, because one of the curious things about the states is that although they have the most robust freedom of expression uh, laws and therefore the greatest freedom for the media to do naughty things, um, they don't to anything like the degree that, that people do in, in, in the UK with our harsh libel laws. Um, and it's similar in France. Um, the laws actually are rather feeble in, in terms of the penalties that are imposed on uh, journalists in France if they get it wrong. Um, but they do toe the line, and well, have done for a long time. So uh, the, the, there are wide variations across the world. Uh, Francis. Uh, Francis Moriarty, uh, FCC. You, um, just as a passing observation, Hong Kong has on the books some of the stiffest criminal uh, libel laws any place in Asia. In fact, I think there's only three places in all of Asia that have, still have criminal libel. Uh, my question goes to the question of data privacy. We have in Hong Kong a commissioner of privacy who takes a very robust line on linking numbers with information. Uh, and I think many of us feel that the data privacy issue is one that intrudes uh, increasingly on press freedom. So I'm interested in, in how that is working in the UK, where, where you have, as you mentioned, a, a data privacy uh, Yeah, um, it's not good. Uh, we, we have a Europe-wide um, data protection regime, which is about to be revamped um, and become harsher than it was. And the um, current regime has relatively limited protection for journalism, and it's going to get worse. Uh, it, it's, it's, we're, we're having an uneasy time with data protection uh, um, because it's running in parallel with, with privacy law um, in, in other fields. And, um, but once people really get to grips with what, the, what our data privacy laws say <coughs> across Europe, um, there's going to be some difficulty because they are, I think, unduly harsh. They basically start with any information that's personal to, to an individual being protected, unless you can show a reason for publishing it, which seems to me to be the wrong way around. Uh, gentlemen on the veranda. Um, I'm Rob Thibault, um, barrister. I acted for Edward Snowden when he was in Hong Kong. Um, I have a question about um, uh, this regulatory regime. Um, I mean, the the risk of putting something that like that into place would be the chilling effect um, on journalism uh, itself, and um, and uh, whereas the just le leaving the system as it is, with the journalists poss possibly facing criminal prosecution. Um, there's no chilling effect on the journalism itself. There's just the threat that if a journalist misbehaves, breaks the law, like any other criminal, that you're going to be held to justice. 
but with the regulatory regime you're, you're, you're a proponent for, that may have a chilling effect right across uh, journalism in the UK. Well, yeah. I, um, I think the chilling effect argument has to be used with discretion. And it, it really all depends on what the content is and the way in which it's enforced. You say, well, um, leave criminals to be prosecuted when they commit criminal acts. Um, in, in the UK, uh, we have the State Protection Act, which has a criminal offence in it, uh, which is uh, committed by anyone who deals with someone else's personal data or the data of a data controller without their consent. Um, it has a public interest defence, but um, there'd be plenty of opportunities for prosecution under that uh, section, especially since it's um, due to have uh, a two-year prison sentence attached to it as a result of Lord Justice Leveson's recommendations. So I'd be concerned that, that um, a government unfriendly to uh, the press could uh, exploit the criminal law in ways which would be buffered by a regulatory system. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, the way I see this is it's just a knee-jerk reaction. I mean, the journalists who committed these offenses with uh, the phone tapping, they ha they're educated. They should know better. They shouldn't have done that. And if the bosses were involved and companies were involved, it's just like anyone else in society. If you break the law, you can be prosecuted. But... Um, you know, to have a regulatory regime, you know, another layer of regulation doesn't make sense to me. I, I think that if there's a problem with journalists, that they lack the professional personal integrity, then it's going to be <coughs> universities, fellow journalists, who are going to have to increase their... Well, but that's... That, I, I see your point, but I, I, we, we can disagree about this, but um, <laughs> part, part of the regime that's proposed and, and uh, is actually coming into force will be uh, to um, keep, keep watch on the... Uh, journalistic standards and practices. So there's an educational aspect to it. Um, maybe I'm uh, wrong about this, but I, I think we just have to agree to disagree. <laughs> well, I think that's what, what, the, what, what we're talking about, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're talking about a, an organisation that will uh, have uh, independence, it'll have journalistic um, people on it. It'll be very similar to the existing regime that we've got, except it will have additional powers. Yeah. Interesting, interesting argument, but uh, I, I tend to disagree. I think, I think the journalists will do fine if more education is required. Um, and I, th I think this phone tapping incident caught everybody out. And I think to bring in more legislation and, and this layer of regulation, is typically what governments do. They say, oh, there's been some bad, bad journalists, let's, let's regulate. Oh, but um, it's, it's important to understand this isn't, this isn't uh, what, what's going to happen, if I'm right, is not a, a result of legislation. It's a voluntary press-organised regime. There's no statute involved. I think we have time for just one very quick last question, if uh, anyone wants to amplify on any point. Gentleman here. Does a citizen have any recourse against um, a public authority that maliciously prosecutes him uh, by coercion from big intra business interests or otherwise? There is a, an action for malicious prosecution that you can bring against a, a prosecutor, yeah. And that's, that, that, that's a legal, recognized legal cause of action, of course. Um, your question um, raises the, quest the issue of proof, um, and uh, there's no tackling that, really, is there? I mean, th that would depend on the individual case, but I'm not quite sure what you're, what you're envisaging. It may be something more particular to this environment than the one I'm familiar with. Thank you, Mark. I think on, on that note, we'll have to wrap it up now. Um, thank you very much for everyone's contributions. Thank you very much, Mark, for a, a stimulating discussion. We don't like our guests to leave empty-handed, well-fed, but also with a, a present in hand. So I'll just... Thank you very much, and um, enjoy the rest of your time in Hong Kong.